Welcome to Section 4 of our video series, Fundamentals of IoT Security. In this section, we're going to take a look at the privacy challenges associated with the Internet of Things, the concept of privacy by design, and how to conduct an IoT privacy impact assessment. We'll finish up with a real-world use case looking at the connected Barbie doll. Welcome to our Fundamentals of IoT Security course. In this section, we'll examine some of the privacy challenges associated with the Internet of Things. We'll discuss how you can identify privacy issues through privacy impact assessments, and we'll talk about the approach to incorporating privacy into IoT system designs. The Internet of Things introduces powerful tools for data collection and analysis, but there are challenges associated with ensuring that the large quantities of data collected do not contain sensitive information, as well as how to safeguard sensitive data that's shared across so many devices, systems, and organizations. Let's start out by talking about the concept of pervasive data collection and monitoring. Today, there are sensors, video cameras, and other equipment just about everywhere. Smart homes are outfitted with multiple outdoor cameras, enthusiasts fly drones overhead, oftentimes over people's private properties. Cameras are mounted on cars and motorcycles, as well as buildings and street corners. It's difficult to go somewhere without being captured on camera. But who is collecting this data? Where is the data being stored? What is the data being used for? Who might have either authorized or even unauthorized access to the data? Can the recordings be used against you at a later date? Can they be used to track where you've been? And we're just starting to see this idea of pervasive monitoring. As more and more connected devices come online, all of these questions will become even more relevant. We just discussed pervasive video monitoring, and the same and even more can be said of audio monitoring. In the case of smart home assistant devices, consumers seem to be willing to invite these into their homes. These could be devices such as Amazon Echo or Google Home or even smart TVs by major manufacturers like Samsung. In many instances, we take the manufacturer at their word that they are only keeping recordings or transcripts of recordings that are captured after a specific wake word. These devices are always on, though, and always listening. Oftentimes, vendors will use the transcripts of recordings to optimize their machine learning and voice recognition algorithms. It's important that this data be anonymized, but what assurances do consumers have in this regard? Let's take a real-world example for discussion. During a homicide investigation that spanned 2015 through 2017, prosecutors in Benton County, Arkansas, were informed by a witness that the suspect, James Bates, had an Amazon Echo in the home. They had heard music streaming through the Echo. Prosecutors requested that Amazon turn over the recordings, but Amazon refused citing First Amendment free speech protections. In the end, the defendant gave Amazon permission to hand over the data. What was interesting to note is that Amazon does store the data for an unspecified period of time, and that data can be linked back to an individual account and identity. Think about various IoT devices that you might have. Let's take a smart light switch, for example. The data that might flow between a component like Amazon Echo, or perhaps a smartphone app, is likely a command signal to change the state of the switch to either on or off. But there is other data that may be generated as well. What time was the command initiated? Where did it come from? What room is the smart switch located? These are all examples of metadata that might be either explicitly or implicitly identified by someone that has either authorized access or has successfully achieved unauthorized access to your devices and apps. A link is shown here to a study conducted at Princeton that showed how easy it is to identify and separate unique data streams coming from a smart home and then infer behavior based on those data streams. And that was done using encrypted traffic. Why is metadata needed? Well, it's very useful when it comes to business intelligence and marketing, meaning that many IoT products will capture and transmit this data to the cloud for further analysis. If we take a look at smart home products, we can see the enormous power associated with integrations of those products. Flexible approaches such as IFFTTT allow many types of products to talk to one another. 
These all send data to the same smartphone or home router and create unique associations that perhaps weren't thought of originally for either product. Could someone infer your lifestyle choices or patterns based on these device associations and aggregated data? What about moving from a smart home to a smart health scenario? Is data that was anonymized in one instance ever aggregated with data that could link back to an identity? There was interesting research back in 2015 from OpenEffect. The researchers found that all of the wearable developers that were analyzed, only one had adopted the privacy protections associated with the Bluetooth LE 4.2 protocol. Specifically, wearable developers were still using static public MAC addresses, which could allow historical location tracking. The new specification introduced a dynamic MAC address scheme that reduced the likelihood of location tracking. What does this tell us? That the developers that were putting wearables on the market in 2015 were not considering privacy as a key driver. Are they now? It's obviously not just static MAC addresses either. Many IoT components include GPS trackers. Many other IoT components incorporate protocols like Zigbee that beacon regularly, potentially exposing their location. A security firm known as Praetorian had once shown how easy it is to rig a drone to fly over a metropolitan area and map all of the Zigbee devices. The point being, as developers of IoT products, you need to make sure that you stay on top of privacy safeguards and ensure that no one can track your customers without them knowing about it. The United States Connected Vehicle Ecosystem is a great discussion point on the need for anonymity in IoT systems. You don't want anyone to be able to track your comings and goings while you are driving in your vehicle. With connected vehicle technology, cars talk with each other and with infrastructure all the time. DSRC basic safety messages are transmitted once every 10 milliseconds. Each of these messages is digitally signed with a credential issued by the Security Credential Management System, or SCMS. Fortunately, there were design drivers included in the creation of the connected vehicle ecosystem that focused on privacy and anonymity. Mechanisms such as pools of certificates for each vehicle, where different certificates are used to sign each subsequent message, are included. There is also privacy embedded in the certificate provisioning process to ensure that the certificate itself cannot be tied to the identity of a vehicle or the vehicle's owner. We'll talk more about the SCMS later. The PKI system itself, the SCMS, has a privacy-enhanced design that includes components such as pseudonym certificate authorities, linkage authorities, and location obscure proxies. These components ensure that not even SCMS administrators have the ability to link a vehicle or owner to a set of certificates. Enrollment certificates are provisioned in batches during manufacturing, and then anonymized certificates that last three years and support the use of multiple certificates each week are provisioned by the pseudonym certificate authorities. In the case of a revocation, Linkage authorities are provided with information that can identify the specific certificates that must be revoked. Let's talk a bit about some of the ramifications of pervasive monitoring. Progressive Insurance has a product known as Snapshot that allows them to monitor your driving habits and patterns. This includes things like when you drive, how much you drive, and even how much force you use to brake. They can use this information to customize insurance premiums to your unique situation. These devices can fit directly into your OBD2 port on your car, giving them potential access to lots more information as well. Other insurance companies are already beginning to examine the benefits of using tools like drones to surveil their targets and gain deeper insight for policies. Consider, for example, a home insurance policy in a fire-prone area. Does the insurance company have the right to send a drone over your property on a regular basis to make sure that your vegetation is cut back sufficiently? If no, why not? If yes, what happens when they find an issue? Another interesting challenge associated with the IoT is that it is sometimes difficult to know who specifically your IoT product is talking to. A great research report by OpenDNS in 2015 titled IoT in the Enterprise showed that many consumer IoT devices were already being installed within network boundaries. Many of these devices would beacon out to servers located in far-off places, for example, their vendor's home, even when the devices were not in use. 
do organizations need to monitor for signaling coming out of their organization's smart devices? If we take the concept of not knowing who your device is talking to you to the extreme, then we can look at the case of DJI. DJI is a China-based organization and one of the largest drone manufacturers. In 2016, DJI came under fire over concerns of sharing information collected from customers with Chinese officials. In response, the U.S. Army banned the use of DJI drones. DJI responded by introducing a new local mode for their drones. Local mode cuts off all communications, allowing them to run disconnected from the outside world. Local mode may or may not satisfy the privacy concerns that were raised, but it also reduces the ability of the drone platform. For example, features such as geofencing are restricted when operating in local mode.